read something to you that you wouldn't expect from a, an original Canadian citizen who became an American citizen. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, or at Christmas time, the pursuit of merriment, if you wish. Of course, from the Declaration of Independence. I want you to notice that the writers of the dedication made a distinction between life and liberty and happiness. They said, we have a right to life. We have a right to liberty, but we don't have a right to be happy. We only have a right to pursue happiness because there's no guarantee that we will find it. They were wise enough to make that distinction. You know, there's a lot written about the pursuit of happiness and what is the surest avenue that one must take to obtain it. Dayton was saying that I would talk about three and he could think of four, probably he could think of 40, but, but it's easy to think about them. It's quite a different thing to achieve them. That's why I picked just three. Unfortunately, the hucksters and the peddlers of this world have convinced many that the way to find this happiness, the way to find this gladness, this peace, this joy, other names for happiness, is through the stockpiling of goods or money, power, security. And we know simply by observation that the level of indebtedness and fatigue and disillusionment in this country, never mind other countries, let's just talk about our own, should by now have convinced us that there must be a better way. There's certainly got to be a better way to be happy than just accumulating stuff. So tonight I offer three pursuits that the Bible says will lead us to happiness. There's no guarantee of wealth. There's no guarantee or absence of trouble in these pursuits that I'll talk about. But in the pursuit of happiness, these three will guarantee that at least you're on the right track. You're shooting for the right thing. And at this time of year, at Christmas, it's comforting to know that there is a way to find happiness all year round, not just when Santa comes around. Okay, three things to make you happy. Number one, if you want to be happy, find something worthwhile to do. Find something worthwhile to do. When you examine your day, it is easy to see that your working life takes up most of the time and thus most of your life. A lot of people choose to do what they do simply because it pays well. I remember when I was a kid, you know, my parents used to say, you got to get in with the banks, you got to get a job with the bank, because if you get a job with the bank, it pays well. There was no talk of, are you any good with numbers? <laughs> there was no talk of personal satisfaction. No, it pays well, you got to get a job that pays well. Others work at the only job that they can get. <clears throat> and others work at what is easiest, or they do what they like to do. But happiness is produced when we are satisfied that what we do is actually worth doing. That what we work at is worthwhile in some way. Solomon put it this way, he says, I have seen nothing better that a man should be happy in his activities or in his work, Proverbs 3, verse 22. Now this is a difficult issue because not everybody has the freedom to leave their job or leave their responsibilities and pursue some other career that makes them happy. I remember when I was a school teacher many, many years back and there was people that were working had been school teachers for 15 or 20 years and when we'd talk in the teacher's conference room and the teacher's lunch room and we'd chit chat and they'd say, I hate this job. So, why? I, well, you know, there was one joke, you know, this place would be great if it wasn't for the kids. <laughs> Thinking, 
you are absolutely in the wrong job. But the idea was, well, I've got 15 years in, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm up on the pay grade, how can I leave this job? So it's not always easy to leave your job. There are issues of responsibility, opportunity, time, age, whatever. But the fact that this area is so important should be a warning to young people who are planning their futures and a wake up call to those who continue to make themselves miserable because what they work at is not worthwhile. A lot of people have realized this and made adjustments that gave more meaning to their lives. Some who cannot change work, for example, have found some worthwhile thing to do outside of their normal workday in order to provide meaning for themselves. Others have made complete career shifts in order to train for a new career. I mean, I, I went back to university when I was 35 years old. We had three kids because I wanted to stop the type of work that I was doing and decided that going into ministry was worthwhile for me to do. And that meant a whole career change, a whole life change, what originally brought Lise and I to Oklahoma. And still others begin to find meaningfulness in what they do where they didn't find meaningfulness before. Good example of that is my, my mother, who's, who's deceased, but when she was alive, uh, she worked uh, for 50 years, she worked as a waitress a server in a restaurant, all kinds of restaurants, hotels, whatever, that's all she did. You know, she grew up in a family, there were 11 kids, you didn't have the luxury back then, her, her, her dad died in 1929 at the height of the depression, left her mother with 10 children, one passed away, 10 children, widow with 10 children. And so there was no, you know, I'm going off to college or I'm going to travel in Europe for a year to find myself, there was none of that. You know. It was, you go out and get a job and bring some money home, and so she went out and did what she could with the little education she had. She got a job in a restaurant. She used to tell me that during World War II, she, as a waitress, would make as much money as a lawyer because it was a, the highest paying job that a woman could have back then who was not educated. And she also told me that she hated it. She thought it was beneath her. She thought she could have done better if had things been different. And so what she did, again, telling me the story, is that for the first 25 years of her career, she hated it. And then one day she decided, you know what, I can't get out of this, I have no training, so I'm going to change the meaning of my job. From here on in, the meaning of my job is not going to be that I'm going to take food from the kitchen and bring it over to a table and just plop it down. That's not going to be my job. My job is every person that comes in and is seated in my section is going to leave happier than when they came in. And I'm going to figure out a way to make that person feel better by the time they leave, whether it's by my service or if they, they seem lonely, a little chit chat, a little extra cup of coffee, whatever. And she made that her personal goal. And as she was telling me the story, she recounted the fact that this changed everything in her work life. It made her work worthwhile. And she also said it doubled her tips. <laughs> Go figure. So the pursuit of happiness requires us to cut away activities that serve selfish ambition and the agenda of godless men and invest ourselves in worthwhile things, meaningful work, noble enterprises. I mean, that's if you want to be happy. So number one, find something worthwhile to do. Number two, if you want to be happy, find someone to love. I mean, you could have come up with these. These are not that complicated. Find somebody to love. You know, I often am critical of the media because of its excessive worldliness and promotion of sinful things. But one thing the media has done is to demonstrate how badly people need love. I mean, look at the movies. It's all about love. Even vampires need love. 
TV comedies about love, songs. I mean, if, if you took out two words out of the English language, it would cut down popular music by 80%. If you took out the word baby and love, I mean, we'd have 80% less popular music because most music is about somebody looking for love, finding love, losing love. Book racks are filled with romance novels. Our society loves love. And we can't get enough stories and songs and movies about this topic. The problem is that the main feeling you go away with is this. Wouldn't it be great if somebody loved me in this way? You go see the vampire movie and say, wow, the way that person loved that person, I sure wish I could find somebody who loved me that way. But you see, finding somebody to love me is not the way to be happy. Romantic love is not a guarantee of happiness. It may lead you to some sexual intimacy, but it doesn't guarantee happiness. Happiness in, is produced when we find somebody else to love. Anybody. I mean, it could be the neglected neighbor or the lonely kid that's in your class. It could be the widow or the widower. I spoke recently at uh, Eisenhower. Eisenhower funeral uh, homes do a thing around Christmas time where they invite all of their clients from the past year to come to a, a special devotional service, a great thing that they do. And this year they, they asked us to go uh, uh, speak there. And um, one of the things that was mentioned during that service was that when someone dies and you're, you know, if it's your spouse, you know, you're a widow, widower, something like that, the first week or two, there's such a rush of activity. You've got 64 casseroles you know, in your kitchen, in your, in your refrigerator. You can't eat all the food people bring you. There's traffic, the phone's ringing, go to the funeral parlor, do this, do that, da, 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 da. And then, boom, it all stops. It all stops because everybody else is going back to their normal life. And the point that was made was that all that activity and that all that attention that that person got there while you know, the funeral was happening, they didn't even see it. They didn't even notice it. It just goes by in a blur. The time they really need that attention, the time they really need that visit is a couple of months down the road when everyone else has gone back to their normal business and that widow or that widower is left all alone and the reality of their situation finally hits home. They're gone. No more phone calls, no more everybody popping in to see how you are, nobody dropping by with casseroles. They've gone on with their lives, they've gone on with their husbands and their families, but I'm left here alone. Maybe there's somebody like that that we know. Try loving that person, or maybe a family member, or maybe that person in the nursing home or in the hospital, maybe that stranger at church. You see, it's not the getting of love that creates happiness, it's the giving of love that creates happiness. Receiving love is comforting and encouraging, it's enjoyable, it's satisfying, it's pleasurable, I'm not denying that. But giving love is godlike. Giving love is selfless, it's pure, it's holy, it's good, it's righteous. And it's these kinds of elements that produce a happy heart. It's not just pleasure that produces a happy heart. The trouble with pleasure, nothing wrong with pleasure, but the trouble with pleasure is you can't hang on to it. You experience it, it's there, and then it's gone. But holiness and joy and goodness those type of things you can savor. Those type of things you can experience on an ongoing, business, uh, ongoing basis. And it's these types of things that create the happy heart that so many are looking for. Again, Solomon echoes this idea when he says, he that has mercy on the poor, happy is he. 
Proverbs 14, verse 21. So many are frustrated and miserable because they think that the reason for their unhappiness is because they have found no one to love them. Woe is me, nobody loves me. Why can't I be happy? Why can't somebody come and just love me? When the truth of the matter is that the potential for happiness is within each of us and tied directly to the degree that we extend our love towards others, not how others love us. And then the great pursuit of happiness requires us, as I said, A, to find something worthwhile to do, B, find someone to love, and then number three, find the right thing to hope for. You might have guessed one and two, but I don't know about number three. <coughs> find the right things to hope for. In the poem, The Inferno by Dante, the poet describes the different levels of hell and the various types of people and punishments that, are, you know, that await in hell. Very long poem. And at one of the lower levels of hell, Dante writes that there is a sign that awaits all who descend and it reads, abandon hope all ye who enter here. Woo. Now I suppose that this is probably the worst psychological punishment a person can endure. When I watch television and I, and I see someone who's committed a crime of some kind, you know, uh, Bernie Madoff, let's say, the, the, the embezzler, the, the, the person who embezzled all those people, the Ponzi schemes, you know, he, he built uh, billions of dollars out of his investors. He was sentenced to 152 years in jail. I mean, that translates to no hope at all. Even the guy who's like 40 years old and he's got to do you know, 21 years in jail for a serious crime, it's a long time, it's a lifetime, but he's thinking, well, 61, you know, if I live to be 85, I'll still get, you know, I still can get 20 more, you know, there's a little glimmer of hope there. 150 years, no hope. There's nothing more psychologically devastating than a situation that has no hope. The absence of hope, no chance for change, no reprieve, no opportunity for rescue. Another situation which is not as painful but just as useless is hoping in the wrong things or hoping in the wrong people. The world is full of broken dreams, and shattered hopes because of the uncertainty of life and the inherent sinfulness of people and things. People sin, people mess things up all the time. Now God doesn't discourage us from hoping, from yearning for good things that lie in the future. He merely directs us to place our hope on things that will not disappoint. In other words, if you're going to hope, Hope for things that won't disappoint you. Hope on the person who can satisfy your yearnings and your needs. In that vein of thought, God directs us to hope, for example, hope in the mercy of God, Psalm 33 verse 18. There's something that is sure. I see people sometimes when they've done something not right, and they try to explain themselves or they try to kind of talk their way through it using you know, kind of legalistic language. You know? And I always tell them, no, 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 no. This is the part where you throw yourself on the mercy of God. Don't ever debate with God about your own righteousness. Don't ever get into a shooting match with the Lord about how good you are and how it wasn't your fault or how, you know, well, the Bible really doesn't say that. You know, don't do that. When in doubt, throw yourself on the mercy of God. Why? Because that's something worthwhile to hope for. God directs us to hope in the accuracy of His word. Psalm 119, 74. His word is accurate. You can hope on His word. You can put your confidence in it. 
He directs us to hope in the resurrection of the body. Acts 23, 6. He directs us to hope in the righteousness that comes by faith in Jesus Christ. Galatians chapter five, that's worth hoping. He tells us to hope on the eternal life that waits for believers. Colossians 1.5. He tells us to hope on the Christ and the Savior Jesus. Colossians 1 verse 27. Why? Because we can be sure of these things. These, these things will not disappoint for those who rely on them. These things will be there for those who yearn and hunger and thirst for mercy, for God's word being fulfilled for the resurrection of their body, for eternal life, for the presence of Christ. These are things that we should hope for, not hope when, you know, a lot of young people say, well, I sure hope there'll be something left for me for social security when I retire. Well, you know, maybe yes and maybe no, but you shouldn't be hoping on that. Jesus said, happy are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, why? Because they've hoped on the right thing, they will be satisfied. When your hope rests on the King of Kings and the things of the kingdom, you will be happy now and you will not be disappointed later on. So what I propose to you tonight is not a formula or a quick fix that can be taken like a vitamin so you can feel happy by next week. What I propose means a change in the way you think, a change in the way that you live. Happiness affects your entire life, so it requires your entire life to produce it. So here's what I propose. I propose that you do something worthwhile and that you recognize that doing something worthwhile requires that you abandon something that is useless or something that is less worthwhile that you are presently engaged in at the moment. You see, it's not that you have all of this extra time and energy to suddenly invest into some worthwhile endeavor. For something new to come in, guess what? Something old has to leave. The problem is, that we'd rather be unhappy in familiar surroundings than risk something new and different or less profitable in order to be happier. It's one of the reasons that people don't go for counseling. So many people I know refuse to go for counseling for whatever their, whatever their issues. They eat too much, they drink too much, they fight with their spouse, they're depressed. You know, and you, you say, well, you know, you ought to you ought to see someone to help you with that. One of the elders, go see the minister, you know, go see a professional therapist, you know, get some help. And they won't do it, why? Uh, because the familiar is comfortable. Even if, it's, even if it's painful, at least they know that pain. Another point to consider is this, becoming a person who gives love rather than someone who seeks love is also quite risky. It requires that you die to self. It many times is inconvenient. It's often expensive. It means giving to people who haven't asked and may not even say thank you. It may even demand that you love your enemy or worse than that. It may even demand that you love somebody who gets on your nerves. The happiness that comes from Christian love is not based on what we get back, it's based on what we become from doing it. Becoming more like Christ in loving others is not only pleasing to God, but inherently pleasing to self, which becomes a source of endless happiness. When I am pleased with myself in Christ, I begin to taste the sweet fruit of joy and happiness. And then perhaps one other thing, setting your hope on things above rather than on things below sounds simple, but the shift in emphasis dramatically impacts our daily lives. You know, I told you 
hope on better things, hope on things above than things below. But that can be difficult as well because it may mean you have to reorder your priorities. It may also mean that you have to change your style of living or you may have to give up your constant desire for the things of this world in order to reach for the things of the next world. Jesus summarized it best when He says, where your treasure is, your hope. Where your treasure is, there will be your heart also. Matthew 6, 21. And so I ask you this, is your treasure making your heart unhappy? Maybe it's time to seek another kind of treasure that will never disappoint and that no one can take away or spoil. Are you troubled because there's no purpose, no love, no value in your life? Jesus says, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and what? I will give you rest. And in that rest comes that joy and that peace and that happiness. And so the first step in having a happy life here and forevermore is to come to Jesus in repentance and baptism or return to Him through restorative prayer. Whatever you need tonight, we encourage you to come and make this the happiest night of your life and perhaps the merriest Christmas ever.